Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm your moderator, Andrew Clay Schaefer. Currently, I'm a co-founder at Ergonautic with today's speaker, where we focus on helping organizations evolve their people, practices, and platforms to improve their technology outcomes. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM, or what it has to offer, here is more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top, top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize and Computing Awards, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items on the slide in front of you. If you have questions at any time, please type them in Please type them in using Zoom's Q&A button. We'll organize the questions as Sasha speaks and try to, set, to try to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You'll receive an email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our tech talks. I'm delighted to introduce today's presentation, Future of DevOps, by Sasha Rosenbaum, my co-founder at Ergonautic. With a degree in computer science, an MBA, and two decades of experience across development, operations, product management, and technical sales, Sasha Rosenbaum brings a unique perspective to optimizing the organizational workflows, bridging gaps with empathy and insight. Sasha, without further ado, take it away. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, if it actually lets me do that. We believe in you. If only I worked in technology. Um, so yes, uh, as Andrew said, I'm Sasha Rosenbaum. I work at Ergonautic, a startup that we started um, just a few months ago, actually. And it roughly translates to navigating work, which is what we're trying to help people do. Um, I'm not going to, you know, continue introducing myself too much, um, but, you know, I worked for some companies you may have heard of. I've held basically every job in the tech industry you can think of, and I am hoping that having that broader perspective can help people in other organizations um, improve the ways they work. So I... When we talk about the future, I think it's really, really important to put things in context. And so I think it's impossible to talk about the future without mentioning the past. And so it's to me, it's a big deal to, to put things in context. So I like to structure this talk in, um, you know, kind of ghosts of uh, past, present, and future and take us all on a journey to where we started and when we're going. So I like to start in the 90s, depending on how old you are, you might think that, you know, um, you might relate to this and you can maybe feel nostalgic about some of the 90s stuff, or you might never have seen some of these things before and not even known that they used to be this way. So in the 90s, a server used to be this actual physical machine that lived on a server rack, usually in a data center. Um, it needed to have you know, electricity and cooling and backup generators. And usually getting one was not that easy. Even if you worked for a big organization, usually it was a whole like big procurement process. And if you were lucky, you might've gotten a server in three months, right? So compared to today's experience when I can click a button and just get a server from a cloud, um, that was very, very far away from it. And the barrier of entry for say a solo developer was very, very high. Uh, backup looked like this. Again, you might feel nostalgic for the tape and remember the time it first came out, or you might never have seen this except as a safe button in your software. Uh, but 
basically backups ran on physical tapes. So someone had to go into the data center and start the tape and start the backup um, at a certain time of day. And then they had to ex extract the tapes and put them into a shipment container that shipped to another location. Because of course you can't keep backup at the same location. Now, if you did restore, then you had to reverse this process and you had to hope that your tapes didn't fail, right? So usually when we were talking about restore, the restore window was in days, right? Because you had to basically do all this physical shipment process and then hope that you had a good tape from not too far along ago. Um, so this is a conversation I had with William on Twitter. Um, and he says, I don't know, but I have a misguided nostalgia of forgetting the page and driving to our data center to physically restart a server in the middle of the night. But this is actually what we used to do. We used to actually get a page, go into the data center and push a physical button so that the server can be rebooted, have, have a lesson on Linux, but still happen. Um, the software release cadence was in two, three year cycle. There's some picking up on SQL Server here, but actually, everyone was the same way. This is a normal cadence that people did. And not only that, but also the merge process. So people lived in long living branches and developed their code in long living branches. And so back when, when they all met together and tried to get a consistent version of the software that worked with different features, uh, together that could take months. So the merging and testing process actually could take literal months, right? And so I like this GIF because this is a, what a Git merge used to look like in those days. Also may, may not have been a Git merge, may have been other source control. And again, some people don't didn't use source control. Some people still don't use source control today. Um, also, the majority of software in the world shipped on CDs. So once you were done with this merging process, you actually uh, burn it on CD and physically shipped it to your customer, and then you were done. You actually didn't particularly care about how your customer run this software, or if you were a big enough organization, you had a consulting arm, and you sent a consultant to help a person run your software. So like every company ran its own email. Right? And there was no such thing as a global email server for companies or for personal people. So what this means, among other things, is that the scale at which this ran was a lot different, right? Nobody ran as an email server for a million users, right? And the other thing that it means is that most of the companies that developed software did not run their own software, right? They, their customers run, run the software, not them. Um, it, of course, doesn't apply to everybody. People did have public websites and such things, but in the most cases, you just shipped a software on CD and it was someone else's problem. So SaaS market started, so software as a service started slowly kind of developing in the 90s. So through the end of 90s, we see some things offered as kind of um, as software as a service or what, what it was called back then, application service providers. Um, so it was like in the 99, like which is just, you know, some of the stats here is just because I could find a stat for a particular year. But um, in 99, uh, SaaS software was less than a billion dollars or 175th approximately of estimated software market. The other thing that people did is they had these giant deployment checklists. So when you deployed software, you actually, you had this, actual document, usually on paper and usually look like a book. And you had to go through all of these checkboxes on all of the things you had to do. Uh, typically you had to point and click and actually make sure that you follow the correct procedure. Of course, this documentation also evolved on the fly. And so like these had to be updated and all of the nice things that come with that. Um, part of the thing automation for these things didn't exist is because it was pretty much impossible to implement. So. Uh, Unix and Linux allowed you to write script at, a, at any point, but it wasn't that common even for them. But Windows physically didn't allow you to automate your process, right? Many, many of the configuration stuff uh, just could not be accessed in any other way except point and click. And that was about 40% uh, of server market in 2000. So just think about like, you, you just physically could not make automation happen here. Um, the other thing that was very, very common was maintenance windows. So like I could take down my website for a 
day or two and just call it maintenance. It, I didn't even count it towards uptime because there was, you know, uh, planned downtime and stuff like that. And this was very, very common. It still happens to some extent with some applications, but typically this is not something we can afford to do today. So this was like two weekends like that um, is less than two nines, right? So like, and again, people didn't usually count it towards uptime, but this is totally not the expectation we have of software today. So unavailable systems were estimated to cost American businesses four and a half billion dollars in 96. So just kind of for perspective. The other thing that culturally, all of the departments in your organization are kind of siloed. So like dev, ops, QA, um, even product management, right? So you kind of had these walls between these people. And a lot of times they just communicated through tickets thrown across the wall. And they, they basically didn't have a collaborative conversation uh, about how they deliver software and have a common goal. And so it was basically thought that developers want speed and speed and reliability don't work together. Every time we make a change, something breaks, right? So ops basically push back on change and try to make change as infrequent as possible. Whereas devs you usually were incentivized to develop as fast as possible. So there was this contradiction in the wall between the two. So this is just a graphic. I knew this organization was full of silos. I just didn't know they would be so heavily dependent. And then sometimes things happen that become kind of cultural memes that anybody can refer to. To me, one of those is some conversations that Patrick and uh, Patrick Dubois and Andrew Kleischeifer, my co-host and co-founder, um, had at a TO at 2008. And these were conversations about how to make dev and ops collaborate better. And then um, another interesting moment happened at Velocity in 2009, where John Osper and Paul Hammond gave a presentation about how through collaboration of dev and ops, Flickr is able to deploy 10, 10 times per day. Um, most people just flat out called it impossible, said like, this is, we don't believe you. Nobody can deploy 10 times a day. What are you talking about? Um, and also uh, Andrew happened to tweet about this talk. And this was the first time on record that we know of the word DevOps being used. So that was in this tweet. So then of course it grew bigger and um, encompassed more people. So uh, in 2009, uh, Patrick Dubois ran a tiny conference in Ghent uh, that was called DevOps Days. And it was kind of because of these conversations, because of this incentive for collaboration that we, we are all talking about. And so the drive was just to make uh, operations better and make developers and operations work better together. And then some people, so basically DevOps Days became a volunteer organization that is now running across the world. So you know, in 2019, we had 73 locations around the globe. Uh, I just want to call it Bridge and Chrome out because she was highly instrumental in making this organization happen. Um, but it, it's an organization driven by volunteers. Uh, many of us participate in a particular city. Um, and just this is a conference where people can share their experiences, learn from each other, discuss any topics that are relevant to their job. And one of the things that are very, very interesting is how much we relate to each other when we talk about like how many common problems we actually encounter. So this, basically this organization is how DevOps actually happened, right? So we can see that in 2009, there was no Google searches for DevOps because nobody knew what it was and you know, the term didn't exist. And then slowly over time, uh, people express more interest in DevOps as a concept. Uh, I did a comparative search to tacos and we still lose to tacos like one to, to 10 or one to 15. So you know, we're still not as popular as a way to go. Um, the other thing that's kind of very important to me in the past is this book uh, called Continuous Delivery published by Jess Humble and Bay Farley in 2010. So basically popular is the concept of CICD, which we're all considering you know, integral part of DevOps approaches today, right? So I want to actually talk about these definitions and I wanna come back to them a little bit later, but continuous integration is the practice of merging code into the main branch several times a day and automating the build and testing on every commit, right? So there's two parts of this. It actually started with the definition of merging code and then evolved to encompass build and testing, but this is all very important. Um, and 
I'm, again, I'm going to come back to this. Continuous delivery is the approach in which teams produce software in short cycles, ensuring that the software can be reliably released at any time. So there's also continuous deployment, which means it is released every time. But for most organizations, a healthy practice is to just enable it to be released at any time when a human uh, decision is made that it's ready for release. So um, the other thing, again, this is um, the last thing I'm going to mention in the kind of evolution of DevOps and how it came to be. Um, so in, I believe, 2014, Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Jean Kim started uh, what's called, called a door organization that published a state of DevOps report in collaboration with Puppet. Um, and they tracked a number of metrics in terms of how people are performing on code deploys. And um, they, the four key metrics that are on this slide uh, are frequent code deployments, lead time from commit to deploy, time to recover from incidents, and change failure. So if you look at this, it basically shows you that the organizations that are moving faster, deploying faster, have faster lead time from commit to deploy are also taking less time to recover from incidents and have lower change failure rate, right? So the more change you do, the better you, the, the less you break, right? So, so we were actually wrong about speed contradicting reliability. And so one analogy like for this is software delivery is like a muscle, right? The more you use it, the stronger it gets. So, you know, it, it kind of makes intuitive sense. If the process is painful and error prone, the more you do it, the better you get at it, right? But there's another analogy that I think maybe even better in some contexts is software delivery may be like riding a bicycle. So here, if you go too slow, you're gonna fall over, right? You don't have balance. You don't have um, the ability to maintain balance if you're going too slowly. But there is also such a thing as you can go too fast, right? So when you are speeding up your deployments, you need to think about where your organization is and how fast is fast enough where you could still maintain control over your bicycle. So with that, I can want to switch to the present. Of course, the lines are arbitrary, uh, but you know the kind of mid 2000s uh, is where I draw the line in present in the world we currently live in. So to me, effective automation requires consistent APIs. So one of the things that we couldn't do before is is that like we didn't have APIs for servers and we didn't have APIs for infrastructure in general, right? So we couldn't automate certain things because we simply didn't have anything, any, any APIs to talk to. So one of the major developments to me in this sense was uh, operation, operating system level APIs. So um, Jeffrey Snover is to me a key part of this uh, transformation inside Microsoft. So he worked a number of years very hard on convincing Microsoft executives that the operating system that was created as a point and click that the, the most important thing about Windows was the graphic user interface, right? He worked very hard to convince people that it actually needed to be automatable, right? And so in 2006, PowerShell, which is a Windows configuration management framework and scripting language was released, which made Windows Server uh, be able to be automated. Then we kind of had this development of infrastructure level APIs, right? So um, th this is most evident in the cloud computing world. So Amazon uh, first pop, uh, first developed Amazon Web Services in uh, 2002, uh, and then kind of progresses to the six in Azure Cloud first uh, came on the scene in 2008. They operated at a major scale, right? We're not talking about a couple of server racks that you ran and you could physically go and and you know uh, make changes to them. You had to have APIs. You had to have APIs for taking servers online, offline, failing them over, right? You had to be able to talk to infrastructure at a highly automatable level. And then this also kind of came to um, your own data center, right? Because you had you in in your own data center, you could have different um, servers, different uh, kind of uh, pieces of technology and tech stack. So this is a problem that the clouds usually don't have because they control their like servers back and they can order exactly the same infrastructure, right? But in your in your own data center, you couldn't just replace every server with new stuff. So uh, companies develop infrastructure as code. So for, first came on the scene was Puppet in 2005, and then it was Chef, Ansible, uh, some other companies, 
and some companies continue to develop new features and new new types of infrastructure as code today. But basically, this enabled people to automate their infrastructure. Um, so to me, kind of every wave of automation enables the next wave of automation. So today, if I kind of look at the what's in the industry today, we have a lot more automation, right? So this, this is a true statement, like everybody has a lot more automation, whatever it is they're running. Um, we have a lot more automation tools. In fact, maybe we have too many. So you can automate anything you want from build to release to testing to security controls to, to automated governance. Everything is available to you. You can kind of, as long as you know how to build these things together, you can actually automate anything you want. Um, we have much higher availability, so kind of three, four, nines is the minimal that people minimum that people look at today. Um, the expectations for availability are also a whole ton higher, right? So, in the '90s, I didn't expect my bank to have an app. In 2000s, I didn't expect my bank my banks app to be up on the weekend. And today, if my bank's app is you know, having intermittent failures for a day, I might consider switching to another bank. So your price of unavailability today is very, very high. Um, we do have better on calls. We kind of started treating operations as humans and we kind of um, developed some procedures for reasonable on call and, um, you know, structure and uh, ability to actually um, execute it. And we do have better incident response. Uh, there's some very smart people doing research on how to do best incident response, how to recover from incidents, how to learn from incidents, how to minimize the occurrence of critical incidents and such. Uh, so we are definitely better at it as an industry. And we also, as an industry, we 100% deploy a lot more frequently. Um, so even companies who deploy sort of slowly today are deploying on two week cadence. Um, almost no one takes months to deploy software um, and many people deploy multiple times a day. However, um, if I look around the industry today, there's also things that are not working quite as well, right? So many, many of us are actually bad at monitoring. Um, if you look at organizations, a lot of people don't have any monitoring whatsoever. A lot of people have monitoring, but it, it's kind of, they kind of don't know what that means, right? So you're tracking CPU uptime with such metrics. There's a lot of dashboards. No one looks at them. Uh, no one actually interprets them in terms of meaning. And then some organizations have metrics that are good for investigating incidents, uh, but not much else. So they actually don't know what, you, what their user experience is. Uh, but they might be able to kind of see if the server is down. So monitoring is like this huge uh, space in which uh, not a lot of people are doing well. And then many of us are actually bad at CI. So this may surprise you because everybody's deploying so fast. Uh, but if we come back again to the definition of continuous integration, it's the practice of merging code into main branch several times a day and then automating build and testing of an every commit. And so People have a couple of problems with this. Um, one is people don't merge frequently enough, right? And like long living branches is still a thing. And the, the fact that people don't know how to know if the code, code is merge ready is still a thing. And then the testing is a big thing. So we automated builds and deploys, right? But we don't test and you cannot actually have CI, CD without testing. And when I say testing, I don't just mean unit test necessarily. I mean any quality control that is important to you, right? So if you want um, accessibility that can be part of your quality, if you want um, security standards to be enforced, this is part of your testing, right? If you are doing CI, CD without proper testing, then you're basically delivering bugs to production as fast as possible, which usually doesn't serve anybody too well. So we basically convinced people that deploying faster is good, but we forgot to mention that increasing the operational burden is actually bad. So another thing that I want to talk about in terms of what's happening today is um, a number of years ago, Google came out with this excellent book called Site Reliability Engineering, and this SRE practice started gaining traction um, across the industry. So SRE to me basically is, and the book actually says that at some point that SRE is Google's implementation of DevOps. So SRE is not that different than DevOps, but it's kind of 
we've written some things down um, that could be useful if you're trying to implement DevOps practices. So if I ask a question about why did this redevelop in the first place? So to me, the answer is the SaaS market growth, right? So as if I was running my own email server, I could get away with having a single operator operated email server. But if I'm running Gmail and I have billions of users, I just cannot do that anymore, right? I need an actual practice. I need to be as good at this as possible to even maintain availability and especially to maintain good um, customer service, right? So as we see the SaaS market grow, there's more and more need for being good at operations. And what's the most important thing about SRE discipline? Again, to me, SRE has written down some things that we didn't write down before. We talked about them, um, but we didn't explicitly write it down. And so SRE is about explicit agreements between different groups that align their incentives. So one of the topics that's really, really key to SRE discipline to me is topic of SLAs, SLIs, and SLOs, so service level indicators and um, objectives. So I'm going to start with SLA just because we're all familiar with this, and I'm going through this very quickly. I'm not going into any detail. Um, if you want to read more about SLOs and SLIs, um, you can go read a chapter of the original SRE book or you can pick up Alex Hidalgo's book on SLIs and SLOs. Um, so SLA is financially backed availability. We're all familiar with this. Usually it's a single number and usually it's tracked in the number of nines, usually it talks about availability in the meaning of uptime. And usually people will pay you back money if, you, you if your service is down for a significant amount of time. So SLAs are about aligning incentives between vendor and customer. Again, we've been doing this for decades in this form or another, so this one is a familiar one. Um, SLO, on the other hand, is targeted reliability. Now, notice that I switched from availability to reliability. Reliability is a superset of availability. So availability just means my service is up. Reliability means it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, right? And it's in some ways harder to track. But so the minimum you want to do for an SLO is availability tracking. But the maximum and the desired state is actually tracking reliability. So while SLA is a single metric, SLOs and SLIs are a system of metrics. So usually your reliability cannot be defined as a single thing like an uptime, right? Usually translates to multiple metrics that help you define how you're delivering your value to your users. The other important thing about SLO is SLO's business approved reliability. So if you don't define an SLO, everybody wants everything to be up all the time, right? The tacit expectation of the business is that your service is up 100% of the time. So your ability to define it, say at three nines, is an agreement from the business that three nines is okay, right? And that's a discussion that business and engineering need to have about how much is enough versus the cost because more availability has a significantly increased price tag. And then the other important concept to me is error budgets. So error budgets are acceptable level of unreliability. So error budget is defined as one minus SLO. So if I give an example, if you have four nines, uh, this is 0.1% of unavailability. So this translates to 13 minutes a quarter. So you have 13 minutes a quarter for your maintenance, for your upgrades, for your site to have an incident that without breaking your SLO, right? If you exceed that time, um, then you have to talk about increasing, improving your reliability, right? So this is an agreement that is created between dev and ops. So this is, if, if I wanted to write down DevOps in a metric, their budget is it, right? Because if developers are measured on the same SLO, that the operations people are, then when your budget is drained, developer's incentive is to shift from delivering new features to improving reliability, right? If my bonus as a developer depends on the same number, then I will stop writing new features and I will focus on making sure that the website is up and running and my features are as fast as possible. Uh, this goes the same, by the way, uh, for product management because developers of product management are usually on the same side of this equation, pushing for you know faster updates. Um, and then SLI is actual reliability. So it's service level indicator. 
Um, and it is talking about how you're actually doing. So you basically want your SLI to be higher than your SLO and be high in SLO be higher than your SLA. So uh, you promise, what you promise your customer is less than what you actually uh, target and what, how you're actually doing. So again, a lot of services right now that promise you say three and a half nines, actually their SLI would tell you they're five nines and that's how they're able to uh, confidently promise you that they're, they're gonna do well enough and not have to pay you back money. Um, so SLI obviously requires monitoring that um, the developed um, part that we talked about because without monitoring, you have no way to tell whether your service is even up and running. So like monitoring is the minimum requirement for knowing what your availability is. I know people sometimes start to define their SLOs and start going after five nines or whatever, and they don't actually know how they're doing at all. So they, they don't have any definition. They barely have a pingdom attached to a web page saying, you know, it returns 200. Um, and then the, the second part is good monitoring. So without good monitoring, you don't know that the service does what the user is expected to do. So again, this is a step up from availability to reliability. If my service actually does what my users are paying me for, what my users are interested in, in using my service for. So with that, we can switch a little bit to talking about the future. So this is a bit of a side note, but I have to address it because this is a, you know, a buzz on the internet. Um, so we have to talk a little bit about AI. So with all the new development in the chat GPC world and all the co-pilots and all the things that came out recently, um, is AI going to take your job? So I actually gave a talk on, you know, when is AI going to take your job? Um, a number of years ago, I believe that there is a chance that AI will reach a point at which it takes away knowledge work from people, right? So that that's even even without being general intelligent, there is a point at which it might take jobs away. But I believe this we, we're very far from that point, uh, even with the current development. But AI that we have right now will change jobs, right? We are using ChatGPT all over the place. Um, and th this is kind of, if it provides you competitive advantage, you're just gonna, if it makes your job easier, you're just gonna stop using, start using this, right? So hopefully this acts as your assistant, makes your job better. Uh, but more importantly, I kind of wanna make a point that we don't talk about enough, and that's a point on ethics. So AI has many eth ethical concerns in general, and that, you know, only one is about taking jobs away. Um, bigger one is about bias, but there's a new one that is concerning me with the current generation of AIs that kind of didn't really exist with the previous generations. And that is, so the current AI is sort of like a library. It's not a perfect analogy, but it comes pretty close. So AI aggregates and synthesizes the results of decades of human work. So we took everything that anyone has ever developed and we basically aggregated it and, and synthesized it to some extent, right? So written works and code and art and music, we have now have AI that can um, basically aggregate and synthesize those things. However, unlike a library, the current AI charges the users for the content, but it does not pay royalties and it does not even give attribution to the creators. And that to me is a huge concern because like, so I think the, the deviant art is actually a worse example of this than any kind of coding things. Um, but in a way they're all similar, right? When, when I put content on the internet, even if it's completely free, I expect to at least get, get attribution for the content. And depending on what it's used for, like if you're actually gonna repackage my content and charge for it, I would expect to be paid for it, right? So this is all a, a huge concern. Now, there is a number of class action lawsuits that have been filed against various versions of AI. Um, unfortunately, these class action lawsuits are fighting against companies with very expensive, armies of very expensive lawyers. Um, so, you know, in a capitalistic world, uh, fairness usually loses to profit. And so, I unfortunately, I don't expect that, you know, that this, um, this fallout can be stopped. I also, like, I don't expect particular people to stop using AI because it's unfair because like, again, it provides, if it provides you a competitive advantage, you're gonna use it, right? Because if not, someone else will and they will get ahead of you. Um, 
but this is there's an interesting concern to keep in mind and that that's just like if people are taking my free work and charging someone else for it am i going to stop sharing so this is a big concern to me for open source for instance like are people just going to stop putting their new work in open source repositories because they know this be this is being scraped right same for you know art music or uh, written content but you know, if we all stop putting a new work in open source, then the, the AI cannot um, actually develop with the new concept that come out tomorrow. So this is kind of a thing to, to um, keep in mind if we talk about fairness of AI. So coming back to our main uh, track and talking about DevOps. So of course, one of the buzz on the internet is that DevOps is dead. Um, of course, I don't believe that. Um, but I have had friends give talks about how DevOps is dead starting at least 2014. Um, this is actually Andrew and Alex in, at SRECon last week uh, giving a talk about how DevOps is dead and SRE is dead now too. Uh, but basically, you can see on the gravestone, DevOps died in 2014 and it continues to die today. Um, but this, so this is actually Patrick Dubois tried to uh, kind of look at all the shades of ops people in the industry. Uh, in 2021 during the pandemic, um, there is a lot there, right? Like we have so many people that are basically doing some kind of operations, whether you call them DevOps or SRE or you call them something completely different doesn't really change, right? Someone in your organization is keeping your systems alive and depending on where you are and how you're doing on this spectrum, their life might be held. So it's my opinion that the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed. We have companies that are implementing best practice of all we talked about and are doing extremely well and basically, you know, deploying on every commit and testing everything and having all the automated governance controls implemented and um, just basically, you know, their, their uptime is um, amazing and their like reliability is measured with hundreds of SLOs that are improved every day and they're doing user analytics all over the place. And we have companies that basically haven't changed since the 90s at all. So what I see a lot in the industry is that teams are just getting continuously renamed, right? And it's like another kind of transformation every day. So some of these teams started as support and then it, it, not every team has gone through every single name here, but like, you know, it started as support, it progressed to system administration and operations and DevOps, as much as we thought DevOps being a job, um, then, then it's been renamed to SRE. Now there are people talking about platform engineering um, without changing any of the practices. So I know teams in this industry right now that are called SRE that are basically functioning as support or basically functioning like ops from 20 years ago. It's amazing to what extent we just adopt the world words and we don't change anything. Um, so this is um, a slide on technology adoption life cycle. So basically innovators and early adopters adopt a new practice because they're seeking advantage, right? Because they want to be better at what they're doing. And so they're seeking who is doing it better or how they can do it better and they're developing and it, new things that can be uh, used for their advantage. And then you start seeing other people come on board with this. And then basically all of this ad adopting majority is seeking legitimacy. So if Google is doing SRE, then now I'm gonna name my team SRE. If um, the, you know, if Netflix is doing DevOps and now I'm gonna do DevOps, um, they kind of adopt the table stakes of the practice kind of, Read a couple, read a couple blogs on the internet, and then claim to actually do the practice. So words cross the chasm before understanding and practice. Basically, you would just keep renaming people and not changing anything. And then we also, after that, we also say this failed. Like we say DevOps failed, S3 failed, whatever it is that we said the transformation was about failed because you know it didn't work here. But in reality, we didn't even try to actually. Um, understand and implement the practice. So in most organizations I encounter in the industry today, even those running SaaS, um, they have no SRE practice, which is actually kind of scary if you think about. It. So, you know, when we talk, we can talk about DevOps or SRE um, in this sense to me, they're pretty interchangeable, but basically 
you're running a software that is released to your users and you basically have no practice of making operations better. Um, most organizations today, and I'm just calling out like things I see every day is people don't merge code frequently. People don't have quality testing during their CI. So like they either don't have testing at all or they have very rudimentary tests. They have, you know, a few unit tests or a few flaky UI tests at the very end of it. Um, no other quality controls. And basically what it results in is you have code that you're pushing to prod, but no one is exactly sure if it's going to work, right? So like, again, you automated all the parts of it. So you, you build and deploy are very fast, but the humans are very scared that every time that they deploy to production, they're gonna get a hundred support calls um, from their users. People don't have informative monitoring. And again, I talked about it quite a bit. People don't enforce error budgets. So A, a lot of organizations haven't even heard of error budgets, but even people who say they do error budgets, a lot of time they have something defined, but no one ever looks at it. So like, if you don't stop development when you exceed your error budget, you're not doing an error budget, right? Like if, if it doesn't influence your practice in any way, then you haven't implemented the, the practice. Um, and then most organizations basically don't have a platform. So like releasing SaaS without a platform is a road to hell. So this is a stolen joke um, because the best DAO of steel, um, everyone wants DAO ups. Well, actually what they really, really want is reliability, availability, scalability, operability, usability, observability, all of the illities, all for free and without changing anything. In case you missed it, they want it without changing anything, without changing anything, right? So everyone wants to run software, wants to run SaaS when they haven't really solved for the platform. And a lot of times they haven't really solved for the infrastructure. And so like in this three layer cake, actually, if you look at this, Actually, all of this is software, right? So like your, your SaaS is software, your platform is also software and it also needs to be operated and your infrastructure is also software and it also needs to be operated. And even if you depend on the cloud for operating your infrastructure, you need to ensure that either the, your cloud provider operates it to the extent that you can rely on it or you are participating in, in operating your infrastructure to the, to the extent that you can rely on it. And then the same goes for platform kind of that consistent layer that allows you to deliver services at scale. And then same goes for software. Obviously you need to operate your software. And so in a lot of organizations, this is this unfunded mandate in terms of like, um, we, we, we basically operate software, but no one, else, no one knows who's doing it and how they're actually doing it. Um, so my personal mission right now is like, let's bring the future to everyone. Because the, the worst version of the future is that we just invent the next term and we, we basically uh, tell everybody to do it. And like, in reality, we've been talking about the same thing for 20 years at, you know, the SRECon looks the same as every now of says I've ever been to you. Basically, people are talking about the same good practices that could make your life better. And it's just that kind of the message is not getting to everyone. So I don't think we need new words. I think we need to implement what we already know works well. And we need to basically make it um, more available to more organizations in the world. And we need to reduce toil for more operators in the world. And we need to you know, improve on-call and all of these good things, improve deployment process. And there's actually ways we can do this. Um, I just hope we start doing that. And the other message that's very DevOps message is like, let's start small, right? Incremental improvements. Let's not try to eat the entire cake and entire elephant in one sitting. Let's just try to eat it by small bites. So let's not start with handstand push-ups, right? Probably... Probably I'm not able to do this right now, but I could start with wall push-ups and progress to regular push-ups and then I could maybe progress to handstands and then maybe I can get to handstand push-ups. So we don't all need to be Google, but we can all slowly get better until we are a pretty good, you know, um, operator. So the future is already here. I do really like this quote. It's just not even evenly distributed. So 
my job right now is to distribute it more evenly across this industry. And so thank you very much. I, I would love to, I know there's a Q&A, which I'm looking forward to, but I would love to also continue this conversation on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Mastodon, wherever you can find me. Um, I'd love some feedback, I'd love some questions. So please reach out. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs> Let's move on to some questions and answers. Uh, what advice would you give to organizations or people who are just beginning to adopt DevOps practices and what dangers or risks should be taken into account? So, so I think my advice, first of all, define your metrics. So when you start this journey, think about what it means to succeed. And that is very pertinent to every organization. So like your organization is different than everybody else and you kind of need to have the context, right? To define the metric. Um, but there are some good metrics um, that are out there. There's the four gold, golden signals. There's other um, stuff that interesting thing is like, again, metrics are also that easy and they can, can be gamed and there's also pitfalls there. Um, but think about how you would know that you would do better, measure how you're doing right now, and then start gradual improvement. And then the gradual improvement to me is like you start where it hurts, right? So you take the process and you say, okay, this particular part in our deployment process is three days, it requires multiple approvals, and it always breaks and it always produces errors. Let's look into that, right? So you kind of start where it hurts and you reduce the toil surrounding that. And then, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully people see that the change is positive and they embrace it. Do you think that the DevOps role is a different role from the developer role or DevOps tasks should be incorporated as part of the process in the development team? So I think it's all the gradient, right? So like when, when we first started talking about DevOps, we actually said like my, one of my friends from DevOps State Chicago co-organizers is um, like refused to take a job because it was called director of DevOps, right? That's how strongly we felt about DevOps not being a job, not being a so separate team. Uh, but fortunately or unfortunately this happened, now it is a separate team in many organizations. I, in some ways I, I mind the S3 name for the team less, right? Because that, that's a separate, you know, kind of understanding of a set of practices versus a culture shift to working better. Um, I think it's ideal if developers are aware of operational concerns, right? Because it's it's hard to, like, if you are not actually even thinking about how, how your application is deployed or how it's running in production, if your concern is just code syntax and how well you implemented a particular library, um, it, it's hard to relate to the same problem. Basically, if you are thinking about the fact that your end goal is your users being happy, then it's a lot easier to, to not see developers and operations as a separate teams um, and collaborate on that. Now, I, I'm also like, I don't like the expectation that everyone should know everything. Like, like that's impossible, right? You, you can be good at one domain and you can have awareness of other domains. So um, ideally developers are not the operators. Ideally developers are not responsible for top to bottom operating your software. And Andrew, I know you have opinions too, you can share some. <laughs> we're, we're featuring you today. <laughs> Many of us are bad at CI. Is this because the tools are complex and not easy to learn and maintain? So I don't think it's about the tools. I think the tools are fine. I think the tools enable us to do everything we want today. Um, I think the mandates are the problem. So the mandate is usually go faster, right? Not go better, go faster. So like, let's, you know, deploy not every 12 days, let's deploy every three days. And it's like, have you considered how your deployments go? Like I. If you are losing sleep, like a lot of organizations still say, like, you can't deploy on Fridays. Why? Because it's a nightmare, right? Because then everybody ends up being in the office all weekend. If you're at that stage, then don't deploy on Fridays. You can't just say, like, oh, let's be faster, right? I think, so, I mean, on the tool side, of course, everything is hard to maintain. Like, every everything continuously updates today and everything, the ground shifts underneath you every day. Um, and there's good and bad in this. Like, one is we put you know, perpetually playing catch up. But on the other hand, we're getting the greatest, latest and greatest, hopefully from our um, CICD tools. But yeah, I think 
think about process, not tools, and think about why it hurts. And again, usually it hurts for one of two reasons. Either you don't merge frequently enough or you basically don't have any quality assurance. Related, can all quality tests be automated? Um, probably not, but you can, you can get to a point where, where you have automated enough tests that give you confidence that what you release into production is good, right? Um, so if you look at, uh, it's in Google S3 book, but it's also a number of other places, the testing pyramid. So like the bulk of your testing should be unit tests, but they should be quality unit tests, all right? Example of bad tests is one plus one equals two, right? If I'm testing that the test performs exactly what I asked it to perform, I'm, I've actually gained no new information. So test coverage is not necessarily a good metric for this. Uh, good unit tests, and we can dive into TDD and whatever, like good unit tests are defined to um, test the functionality. So the test is developed be before the code, and you actually think about what, what is um, defining the functionality to the user that I'm trying to deliver to, to the extent possible. It's not always possible because um, it's not always user facing. But basically, um, the good, good testing starts with a lot of unit tests. Uh, and a lot of unit tests are run very quickly and a lot of unit tests are very reliable. So like you, you shouldn't have flaky tests to the extent possible. Um, and then kind of you progress to integration tests and then you progress to uh, UI tests and UI tests should be the, the very top, very small layer of your pyramid that is just allowing you to test some key functionality in UI. How can you ensure good monitoring? Boy, um, so the, uh, first of all, try to actually do it, but the other is because a lot of people don't. Um, what I see is like a lot of people just don't do any monitoring or they buy a tool that comes with predefined dashboards, right? And then the dashboards are there and, and that's the monitoring. And then whatever the, you know, your monitoring tool offered you that this is the thing. And then no one looks at it unless there is an incident, unless there is a, a problem they're trying to solve. And these dashboards like are usually pretty good at solving incidents, but they're usually not informative. Like, so I actually don't know how I do. So a couple things on monitoring, one is, when you define metrics, think about them being proxy for the user value, right? So like if my user expects, I, I don't know, let, let's give a simple example. If I expect to have a checkout button and I can't check out um, out of my shopping cart, like that's a key user functionality. If user can't do this, then like I'm having a problem, right? So like that should be what you monitor, not, the, not like your CPU uptime, right? So like come as close as you can to the user. Second thing is like, don't make it very gameable, right? So like my least favorite metric in existence is velocity because it's all like very gameable. And it's like, oh, we're going faster. It's like, we just broke stories down to smaller, smaller points and now we're going really fast. It's like, okay. And then the other thing is like, did you deliver value? We don't know. We just delivered 20 stories more than the last sprint. It's like, okay, that's, that's really cool. Um, so kind of try to approximate value. And then the third thing is metrics should come as a system. So like, the more you focus on one side of the aisle, the more kind of lopsided you become, right? So if you focus on quality, you might reduce your responsiveness or your speed. If you focus on speed, you might reduce the quality. So if you measure both of these, then you can kind of create a system of metrics that balance each other. Um, and then the last thing, and this is a lot, um, create, like, create metrics with who looks at them and when in mind. So like, when you define your metrics, it's not just like, oh, I thought it would be nice to measure X. It's like, okay, I'm going to show this to my CTO once a month on first Monday of the month, and I'm going to show them how, how I was doing for last month, and we're going to look if we're doing better or worse. So like, define this with a cadence in mind with, a, with the idea of where you're trying to actually get with it. I'm going to try to summarize a, a number of related questions. So. Uh, it starts with this kind of notion of important milestones with virtualization, containerization, and uh, the kind of like the theme of a bunch of questions is what is the role of cloud computing in in DevOps? This is fun. I, I think so. I've spent like 10 years um, helping people move to the cloud, and I'm a little bit of like a convert because I think 
we went from like cloud is evil, right? Where no banks would talk to me because it's like, oh, I've never put in my infrastructure to the, into the cloud to like, everybody must go to the cloud. Why? Because we don't know, right? So I think cloud is really important because it allows you to move faster. If you're, if you're a solo developer, like, of course you go on cloud, right? Like I'm not buying a data center. Um, and it, for some organizations, cloud makes a lot of sense, but this kind of idea of like, everything must go cloud is, silly, especially today, because the regular, regular quote unquote data center is now automatable, right? So you can have an API in, the, in your regular data center and cloud doesn't always solve your money. So like cloud is instrumental, but not mandatory to implementing these practices, especially not today. Um, and then same goes for containers. I, I feel like there's a pendulum in the industry. It's like, oh, let's go bigger centralized. Let's go smaller decentralized. Moving to a new technology without understanding what kind of benefit it's going to give you is usually not a good idea, right? Because if you just containerize everything without changing how the application works, you actually introduce you more problems, right? Because it's a new technology no one knows how to work with, because you're introducing networking delays and communication between services, because you're introducing extra APIs, which are a contract between services. So now like, instead of compiling it all together and knowing that it works with each other, now people push updates in different, in different uh, times and like can break each other's things. So like when you moving and adopting this, these new technologies, you need to actually again, have a metric for like, what is it gonna, what problem is it gonna solve for me and how? Where do you see software and system security fitting into your understanding of DevOps? So I think it's interesting because we came up with the word DevSecOps and, you know, and maybe it's good because it's, it makes it more explicit, but like security should always be part of the game. And I, I believe in the whole shift left on security and security should be part of your pipeline and actually governance should be part of your pipeline, right? When you release in software, it should be as early as possible. You think about security in software design, threat modeling, and then all the security controls throughout the process. But it's really important. And so, like to me, you, you can't again. This is about quality quality control, right? If you are deploying every day, but you have no idea how many CVs are in your code, it's probably a bad idea. You probably should go fix your CVs before you deploy faster. <laughs> that kind of stuff. There's a lot more fun um, to have with the questions, but we're going to finish with this last one. Uh, what is the difference between what was described as monitoring, SLA, SLO, SLI, and observability? So observability is a new fancy word. And so observability is ideally you kind of learn from trends. So, so monitoring is I look at a specific thing and then it gives me an answer. Observability is I look at a, at a overall picture and I, discern a trend that I wouldn't have known otherwise, right? Um, I think we we should start with monitoring because if we start with observability and we don't have monitoring, that kind of isn't helpful. Like the 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 fun thing is like, you know, there's there's companies selling you chaos engineering. It's like, how can you do chaos engineering if you don't know if your site is up? Like you against the, the Chasing new cool buzzwords is cool, but like I, I think we should start where where we where we think we could improve the most. And with that, I think we'll thank you, Sasha, and let everyone get back to doing doing good work out there. So hopefully we all learn something and we can go try to apply it. Like Sasha said, reach out to her on, on Twitter or LinkedIn and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you. Bye, everybody.